All when it's hot and you're tired and lonely and being yelled at, knowing that what's next is absolutely going to be worse. No wonder James says to count it joy when being tested, because no testing is joyful in and of itself. And so know this. You will be tested by God. James does not say, if, as though it were merely a possibility. He says, when, indicating that it is a sure certainty. So how do we not merely survive testing, but actually thrive and succeed in it? Abraham will show us the way. Don't you notice first in verses 1 and 2 that God's people are tested through sacrifice. In a very simple but powerful way, God initiates the test. Genesis 22, beginning in verse 1, After these things God tested Abraham. And said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. This test calls for Abraham to obey. He must hear what God commands. He must do it. God is clear in what Abraham must do. He is to take Isaac and sacrifice him to the Lord. We're not talking about the kind of use of the word sacrifice that we do generally where it is painful but rarely deadly. This is a command to kill his son because God said so. Now, we can get all the argument about whether human sacrifice is wrong or whether Abraham ought to have argued with God over ethics. And please understand what I'm about to say. God is free to decide what is right and what is wrong. Human sacrifice is forbidden generally, and yet in this one case, it is commanded by God. Then it is committed by God when God the Father sacrifices His only begotten Son for our sins. So don't get tangled up in theological or ethical problems here. Face the simple fact that God is testing Abraham's faith, his believing obedience, by commanding him to go and sacrifice his son. And it exposes his heart. God says that this test is a heart-exposing test. Isaac is identified as both the son of promise, and the son that Abraham loves. So this test is designed to take what is deep in Abraham's heart and bring it up to the surface. How? Well, by the way, that Abraham will respond. What Abraham really believes and what he truly desires be shown by what he does in response to this command. This is what God is doing when he tests you. He may test you by bringing a hard command to bear in your life. He may test you through the heat of difficult hardship. He may test you by allowing someone to sin against you. These tests will expose what is going on in each of our hearts. And finally, notice that not only does it call for Abraham's immediate obedience, and not only will it expose his heart, but it tests what is loved. This test is aimed at Abraham's faith and love and hope. It's aimed at his faith. What does Abraham actually believe? Is this son, this boy alone, the promised one? What words will run through his heart when he hears this command? How will he work it out so that he can desire to do what God has commanded? And it is aimed at his love. This is the boy he loves greatly. But will he love God more? Will he turn Isaac into an idol? Will he desire the good thing of a promised son so much that he will disobey to keep that son alive? Or will his faith inform his love so that he will trust God implicitly and obey God immediately? 
and it is aimed at his hope. What are Abraham's expectations? Where is his hope? Will he hope first in God? Or will he put all his hopes in Isaac? Will his faith in God and his love for God orient his heart so that his hope follows the real trajectory of God's promises and his purposes? God is testing your faith and your love and your hope. Of these three, the greatest is love. So is there an Isaac that you have at the center of your love? Do you love anything or anyone more than God? If God said, give this up, what would you say no to? So not only are God's people tested through sacrifice, but God's people obey by faith. Verses 3 through 10. Abraham obeys by faith. He sets out to do what God has told him. And what we see in Abraham's response is the kind of obedience we ought to have when tested. Listen to what Moses writes. So Abraham got up as late as he possibly could the next day. Is that what it says? Now Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, stop and think about that. This is three days' journey. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And Abraham said to his young men, you stay here with the donkey. And I and the boy will go over there and worship And plural, we will come again to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, to Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood. And where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And so they went, both of them, together. Now notice it's practical obedience, verse 3. Moses records that Abraham gets up early and begins immediate preparations for the trip. Presumably God's command has come during the night hours. He not only obeys, but gets up early to do so. His obedience is unquestioning and immediate. And his obedience is very practical. He knows where he is going, that where he is going it will be about a 50-mile journey from Beersheba to Mount Moriah. He makes practical preparations. He saddles up a donkey. He cuts firewood. He takes a brazier with hot coals. And he brings along two young men, both presumably as both assistants and possibly as bodyguards. He thinks ahead so that he will be able to complete what God has commanded. We have to stop and think about this for a moment. He has had to send Ishmael away in the weeks and months earlier. He is now going to have to sacrifice his son, his promised and much-loved little boy, And yet the Bible gives us no hint of emotional turmoil, no psychological pain, no resistance, no questioning. How can he do this? When you are asked to do the hard stuff, isn't it easy to drag your feet? To prepare, but not completely. Sort of leave something out so that, well, sorry, it just didn't work out. Aren't we quick to question, to argue, to resist, to grumble, even as we obey? And it's not only a practical obedience, but it is a persevering obedience. Verses 48. James says that tested faith produces steadfastness. It will produce an obedience that is deliberate and persistent. Here is a persevering obedience on Abraham's part. He has a three-day and three-night journey. 
the last day of which will have taken him past the future side of Bethlehem, and up the hillside to the mountain on which the city of Jerusalem and the temple would later be built. And he had to keep on going. He has a lot of time to think about it. He has a lot of time to chatter with Isaac. He has a lot of time to hesitate or even turn back. That Abraham is obeying by faith is evident from verse 5. He tells the servants to stay at Mount Moriah. He says that he and the boy will go up to the mountain to worship and will return. Many translations say, we will go, we will return. Say what? How can he say this? He is marching toward putting Isaac on an altar to raising a knife and killing him and burning him. On what basis does he think then that they are both coming back? Abraham not only knows Isaac is the heir, but he believes it. The author of Hebrews tells us the following. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered, he weighed, he thought, he believed that God was able even to raise Isaac from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So he's going to obey. He's going to do what God said. And since this is the only possible boy through which his future descendants can come, then God has to raise him from the dead. Just has to. Then you have the wonderful, artless question from Isaac. All designed to show us Abraham's stunning fa fa faith. Uh, hey, Dad! Knife? Wood? Fire? Where's the lamb? And Abraham does not look at him and say, you are. Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb, and this is the story of the Bible. God will provide himself a lamb. And we're starting to move into the very center of the story with this statement. This test of obedience for Abraham teaches Israel and all God's people an important lesson. God will provide the lamb. And God will provide the lamb for himself. And so it's a perfect obedience. Verses 9 and 10. And when they came to the place which God told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Seen here is almost too hard to imagine. Builds the altar, he lays the wood, he puts the knife nearby. He ties his boy, his only son, his beloved son, his promised son. And he lays him down on the altar like he has many a lamb before. And he takes out his knife and he raises it. He's ready. To strike. His faith in God, his love for God, his hope in God impels him to a perfect and complete obedience. He is poised to go all the way. Would you? Not a person in this room has been asked to actively sacrifice their only child. But I dare say God has tested all of us in one way or another with what we love, what we believe, and what we put our hope in. 
Are you ready in those moments to go all the way? Verses 11 through 14, God's people trust God. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, there was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh Yara. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord shall be provided. The angel of the Lord and the voice of God reaches out and grabs the wrist of Abraham to stop the descending blow. And he calls out Abraham's name and the test is done. So God's people obey God when they trust in the greatness of God. Verses 11 and 12. God now affirms that the purpose of the test has been met. It is now evident that Abraham is willing to sacrifice anything and everything, including his son, to God. And he does so because of his fear of God, his awe of God, his respect of God. If I can put that phrase this way, Abraham trusts in the greatness of God. True, holy fear of God both trembles and trusts. A real inner conviction of the greatness and the majesty and the sovereignty of God causes believing hearts to tremble lest they disobey and trust so that they do. Maybe part of the reason Abraham's obedience seems so foreign to us lies right here. We believe in the greatness of God we believe in such a way that we might even rest in it. But we often do not believe it in such a way that we tremble under it. We'd better have a respectful awe of such a glorious and grand God. We need to so elevate him in our thinking that such a sacrifice actually makes holy sense to us. Nothing can be withheld from such greatness. And he trusts in the character of God. Verses 13 and 14. God then points Abraham to the ram in the thicket. Abraham gathers it up. His son takes his son off to the altar, probably with a deep sigh of relief from Isaac, and worships God through offering instead of his son. And he names the place Yahweh Jireh. God will provide... God has trusted, Abraham has trusted the character of God. He has believed that God is one who will provide. He will provide his son and heir. He will provide if he sacrifices his son. He will provide a lamb. This is how he has obeyed. He knows his God so well that he just rests in who God is and does what God requires. Will we? We know God so well that when the hard sacrifices are required, we simply move in believing obedience. When we ought to obey a hard command of the Bible, then we, do we think through who God is and what he has promised and how he has moved for the good of his people and the glory of his name? Or do we fidget with doubt and then disobey? Now, I want to be pointedly personal about this, taking it into a realm where we all live. This is not about God speaking to you over something you treasure as though the response to this message is to have a Mount Moriah moment and everyone brings something that is valuable to you to give to God to show that, well, you get it. You and I should be hearing this message over the commonplace things that God requires, and yet we don't do. We don't do them because we do not fear Him, we do not trust Him, and if we cannot obey God in the ordinary duties of being a Christian, what will we do if we are asked 
to surrender something extraordinary. What about your obedience and loving family, parenting children? What about believing God and obeying way in your relationships with Christians in serving God and faithful stewardship? What about giving? What about obeying God and helping others and serving others? So will you count it all joy when you have trials and tests so that your obedience, even your sacrificial obedience, results in steadfastness? God is testing his people through sacrifice so that they will obey God and learn to trust him more. But God's people in the midst of testing will receive hope-giving assurances. Verse 15, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself. I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, as the sand that is on the seashore. And then your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And your offspring shall all the nations, in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men. And they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived. Abraham dwelt. Abraham settled down in Beersheba. God is pleased to not just give Abraham his approval, but also to affirm his promises. God declares again over Isaac his great purposes and promises for Abraham and his heirs. And God's people, therefore, receive hope-giving assurances. They receive it from the Word of God, verses 15 to 18. Now, Abraham is hearing this directly through the voice of God. We hear these kinds of approvals and affirmations through the Word of God. Yes, we hear God's promises and purposes with the effect that we have assurance and hope. In the midst of and coming out of testing, God is so pleased so often to bring sweet assurance and peace in our heart. And then God brings, and then for a confidence in God, verse 19. Abraham returns with his son and servants. And for the first time we are told that he lives, not sojourns, in Beersheba, The nomadic wandering design to claim the land is largely now ended. He settles down in Beersheba. God's hope-giving assurance brings a serene confidence in God. This is a stunning text. It's stunning in its requirement. It's stunning in its obedience. It is stunning in its culmination. And it is so wonderful as it flows out into the settled peace of a settled life. So how do we navigate through this so that the net of truth yields a rich crop of application? First, have you ever asked yourself, how do Old Testament believers sacrifice animals And yet, don't trust in the animal's blood for their redemption. How do they know that the sacrifice of the lamb represents something larger and later? This chapter is the answer. Here a son is brought to sacrifice. God provides a substitute, a ram, in the place of a son. So all the lambs and rams and calves and pigeons sacrificed are in the place of a son until the true son comes. Until the greater Isaac comes, until Jesus, the Lamb of God, is is presented, sacrifices are offered in believing faith. God will forgive sins. God will preside himself a lamb. And he did. 
He provided Jesus, the Son of God, as the final sacrifice. God did what ultimately Abraham did not have to do. God sacrificed his son. Jesus suffered the descending blow of the wrath of God so that we may believe and we may go free. Reminds me of the title of a song, Christ died for God and God was satisfied. Now, how is your obedience? Is it immediate and practical and persistent in the faith of obstacles? Is it complete? Are you filled with doubts and hesitation and resistance and thus with disobedience? Will you surrender to God so that you will sacrifice what God requires? Do you fear Him and His awesome greatness and rest in that greatness as well? Will you with fierce love and faithful trust and unshakable hope obey God regardless? So we face this individually and we will face it corporately. Will we surrender to God when God gives, requires us to give away a treasure that we prize? And God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him. Because on the run of history and salvation, God took his only son, his beloved son, and slaughtered him for our sins. This is the gospel. Gee, Father, press these things home to our hearts. That in this stunning, shocking, surprising, maybe even horrifying story, we see beyond the wonderful obedience of Abraham, the amazing love of our God, that he would take his only begotten Son, his beloved Son, in whom he was well pleased, who never sinned, to suffer, and we might go free. We bless you.